Thank you very much, Mark. So here is the time when you see me a little bit, and then I'm switching to the slide. So should I do that? Go ahead. So the book is about human curiosity. Uh, and the reason I wrote a book about human curiosity, even though I'm an astrophysicist and not a neuroscientist or a psychologist, is because I am a very, very curious person. And at some point, I became very, very curious about curiosity. Um, so I decided to do some research on this, read up on all the research that has been done by cognitive scientists, by neuroscientists on curiosity. And what you see now is the result of that. So let me start with something very um, uh, strange here. You see these uh, abstract painting in front of you. Uh, but inside that abstract thing uh, actually hides the question mark which um, appears on the cover of the book. Um, I start the book with uh, a story, a little story about uh, this uh, writer, Kate Chopin, who lives, lived uh, in the 19th century. Uh, she lived most of her life in Louisiana. Uh, and she wrote a whole collection of short stories and a few uh, full-length novels. Um, and I found something very interesting about her. Uh, one of her short stories is called The Story of an Hour. And this is truly a very, very short story. In fact, it is so short that, as you can see here, the whole story uh, fits on less than one page of Vogue uh, from 1894. Uh, and like I said, it's called The Story of an Hour. Uh, this, by the way, shows her husband, who was a Frenchman, Oscar Chopin, and the house in which she lived. This short story, The Story of an Hour, uh, starts with a startling sentence. It reads, knowing that Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. One can hardly start a short story with a better sentence than this. You, you see, in one sentence, she packs both death and human frailty. So if this doesn't make you curious, I don't know what will. So, and this is her greatest gift. What she's able to do is she is able to generate these intellectual cliffhangers, if you like, with almost every sentence that she writes. And that's why I like that so much. Now, let's start to talk about curiosity. So there was this psychologist, Daniel Berline. Uh, he was a British Canadian. And he uh, wanted to put curiosity on a grid like this, uh, where he gave names to various kinds of curiosity. And the names he used here are perceptual and epistemic diversive and specific. And I will explain what each one of those means. Uh, now, I must give a small caveat here. Uh, psychology is not mathematics. Uh, so you know, when Descartes put a grid like this, he was able to generate all of analytic geometry and all kinds of great things in mathematics. In this case, of course, this particular classification is not unique. Uh, but it is still fruitful in the sense that it helps us map curiosity in these regions. Now, what are these, these different types of curiosity? So let's start with the axis that goes from perceptual to epistemic. What is perceptual curiosity? Perceptual curiosity is the curiosity we feel when we see something surprising, something that doesn't agree with something we know or think we know, something puzzling or something that's ambiguous that perceptual curiosity. Uh, here is an example. These Asian kids see a white girl for the first time in their life. Look at their faces. I mean, they didn't even know that such a thing exists before. And you know, they all gather like this, and they are very, very curious about it. Opposite uh, perceptual curiosity was epistemic curiosity. Epistemic curiosity is the curiosity that drives all basic research. 
is what drives us to ask why and how when we try to understand something. It is the real love of knowledge that many of us have. Again, here is an example of epistemic curiosity. These kids you know, want to understand how these plants grow, you know, what makes them grow, what happens to them, and so on. So that's one axis. Then on the other axis, we had diversive curiosity going to specific curiosity. What is diversive curiosity? You know, being here at Google, I have a feeling that many of you have diversive curiosity. That's the, this expressed by this thing here. These kids there, they sit next to one of the greatest works of art in Western art. This is Rembrandt's The Night Watch. And look what they're doing. They're all looking at their phones. This is diversive curiosity. This is when you have constantly to check for text messages or you wonder what will the new iPhone look like or things of that nature, uh, or Android or whatever uh, mo model of smartphone you're talking about. Finally, there is opposite diversity. There was specific curiosity. This is when you're actually curious about a very particular piece of information, you know, like, uh, who was it that created the first chip for the first Android telephone? Or, uh, you know, we saw this film last week. What was the name of the actor there, you know, and so on. Like, you know, for, for example here, who is this? Does anybody know by any chance who this is? This is Ernest Hemingway. Uh, here is he in 1918. He is uh, in Milan. So that's specific curiosity. You need a very specific piece of information you're given that piece, and that's it. You, you're satisfied with that. Now, while before I start describing to you the research on curiosity, the neuroscientific and psychological research, I, I thought in the book, I decided to look at a few very, very curious people, both in the past and people who are living, and to analyze a little bit what is it that drives them? What is it that you know, made them such exceptionally curious individuals? So the first one is Leonardo da Vinci. He has been called by uh, you know, art critic Kenneth Clark uh, the most relentlessly curious person to have ever lived. And indeed, Leonardo was amazing in many ways. Of course, he has incredible works of art. He has all kinds of very interesting inventions. Uh, associated with his name, but perhaps most amazing is, are his notebooks. Uh, these are two pages from his notebooks. There are today about 6,000 pages that remain from the collection of about 15,000 pages of notebooks that existed. When you look at this, it looks at first like some collection of unrelated doodles. By the way, he he filled, you know, if you look at the period of time which he wrote notebooks, uh, you, you discover that on the average, he had to fill out every day at least a page and a half, every day, in order to get this amount of notebooks. The notebooks always contain drawings, and they also contain writing, which he always wrote. He was left-handed. He wrote from right to left and in mirror image. In order to read it, you needed to put a mirror to it. Now, you look at this, and at first, you know, you don't see much connection between the things. When you look a little bit more carefully, you start to see two main themes here. One is a whole host of geometrical curves, and then certain phenomena. And the phenomena include waves in a pond, water. There are clouds on the right-hand side of this image. There is the hair of this old gentleman, which looks almost like the clouds exactly and things like that. Then there is the phenomenon of branching. You have this plant right in the middle of the figure. You have a tree right underneath the old gentleman. And you cannot quite see it here, but if you look up close to, uh, at this image, you will see that actually the branches of the tree, they are transformed into the veins of the old man seen through his coat. So the two phenomena here are curves and things related to these curves, and branching. So this gives you a little bit of an idea how his mind might have worked. You see, he was 
very visually inspired by things that look in certain ways. So let's say he started you know, studying, OK, how do waves propagate from a pebble thrown into a pond? He looked at that and he said, aha, there are some geometrical curves associated with that. Once he had the, those curves, he started thinking, but in what other phenomena do I see curves like this? And that led him, let's say, to the clouds or to the hair of this gentleman. And you know, if you look at his drawings, when he draws flows of water, which is a phenomenon he dealt with a lot, then his drawings of flows of water look very much like braids of hair. And when you look at his drawings of hair, uh, for example, the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. has is painting Ginevra de Benci. You look at the hair at the front of her face, and it looks just like turbulent water. So he really connected these things in his mind and, and you know, thought about them together. Now, what was he interested in? In everything. You know, you look at the collection of books he had at one point in time, 106 books. There is almost no topic that he didn't have a book on. There is one topic that he really stayed completely off, and that was politics. And that was a very good idea, because he lived at the time when the Borgias reigned. And the Borgias, just everybody who got involved in their politics got more or less killed. Leonardo, by staying completely out of politics, actually managed to have them patron his works and, 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 and fund him. So he also was very, very interested in anatomy, of course. And his interest in this was very different from that of almost anybody at his time. Because you see, the theory of anatomy that was prevailing then was done by Galen you know, in ancient Greece. And everybody just adhered to that. And what they used to do, even when they already did dissection on cor corpses and so on, all they tried to do is to prove that Galen was right. Leonardo, on the other hand, he didn't want to prove that anybody was right. He wanted to learn what's there. So for example, in the heart, to which he spent more, than to, more time than to any other organ, he discovered the atria of the heart, which weren't known before him, what their role was. He discovered how heat is generated in the body through the flow of the blood and things like that. So he really tried, he showed this epistemic curiosity. He tried to learn by being so curious. The second person I discuss in the book is Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman, of course, is a legendary physicist. Uh, there is almost no branch in physics to which he did not contribute. But he also did works in biology. Uh, he also was a drummer uh, you know, on a bongo. He actually went even to Brazil to learn uh, some of the uh, to drum. Uh, he was interested in Mayan hieroglyphs. He was interested in safe cracking. Uh, and generally, he basically had this notion that everything is interesting if you get into it deeply enough. Now, at one point, Feynman started to learn how to draw. Because he said that there is this beauty in nature, which is a beauty not of the type that you know what normally painters do, but a beauty in the understanding what nature is all about. And he wanted to be able to draw this. So he asked his friend Zorthian, who was a, uh, was a painter, to teach him how to draw. And he actually tried to teach him physics. Uh, wasn't particularly successful in teaching the artist physics. But he, he himself you know, became OK in, in drawing. Uh, and I want to show you a page from his notebook. And this is a page from Feynman's notebook. And just look at this. The mathematics is, of course, more complex than it is in Leonardo's. And the drawing is of lesser quality than the drawings of Leonardo. But other than that, I mean, this could have been, you know, you could have exchanged their notebooks. They both were interested literally in everything. So, you know, these two people, of course, come at the very extreme edge of curiosity, you know, compared to almost any other people. Let's now get into the research on curiosity. So 
a few, in 1994, uh, psychologist George Lowenstein from uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University proposed a model for curiosity, uh, which was called the information gap model. What was this model? The idea was the following, that when we see something that does not agree with our beliefs or with what we know or with what we think we know, a gap is formed. It generates an aversive, unpleasant state in our mind, and that curiosity is the mechanism by which we try to get rid of this unpleasantness by finding new information. So curiosity in the information gap model is a little bit like a scratch, uh, an itch, sorry, that you have to scratch. So you have an itch, you have to scratch it. That's what he says. Now, associated with this is this inverted U-shaped curve of curiosity as a function of knowledge. The idea is the following, you see, the claim is, and, and I, I will show you that experiments actually confirm this, when we know about something very, very little, we're not curious about it, because we don't know what to be curious about. When we know about it a lot, and we feel we know almost everything, we're also not curious about it, because, you know, what we don't know is very little and it's, it's deemed unimportant. When we get curious is at the middle of this curve, namely, when we know something about the subject, but we also feel that there is much more to be known. That's when we become truly curious about something. Now, believe it or not, but a former Secretary of Defense actually once, without knowing about curiosity or no such thing, actually captured this idea of this inverted U-curve. Uh, this was Donald Rumsfeld, who once had a press conference in 2012 uh, b before the Iraq war. Uh, he was asked at the press conference, what does he have to say about the fact that there is no evidence that is, Iraq is transferring weapons of mass destruction to terrorist organizations? And that was his answer. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. That was his answer to that question. Now, there is a British organization that every year gives the photo in the mouth award uh, for somebody <laughs> for some statement they made, they gave it to him that year for the most baffling statement made by a politician. Um, and by the way, uh, the runner-up that year, number two prize, was uh, actually given to Arnold Schwarzenegger, former governor of this state, who said, I think that gay marriage is something between a man and his wife. So he got the second prize <laughs> for that. Um, now, what Rumsfeld said, it's, 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 it's very funny as an answer to a question about weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> but actually, as a statement, is actually a very logical statement. You see, there are things we know we know. There are things we know we don't know. And there are things we don't know we don't know. Now, this actually captures that curve of curiosity. You see, when we know we know, that's when we think we know everything and we're not curious anymore. When it's unknown unknowns, we're also not curious because we don't know what to be curious about. When are we curious? When there are known unknowns. When there are things we know that we don't know. That's when we become curious. So oddly enough, this bizarre statement, which is, however, logical, actually captures that thing. Now, experiments actually confirmed the idea that at least for perceptual curiosity, I remind you, that's the curiosity you feel when there is something puzzling or ambiguous, then it is actually associated with 
an unpleasant feeling, and it also activates those regions in the brain. How do they do that? How can neuroscientists do, do these experiments? So what they do today, I mean, they have tools that once were not uh, available to them. Uh, they can do functional MRI. Namely, they can put people inside MRI machines and can try to make them curious and to see which regions of their brains are activated. Now, these are not easy experiments because you cannot t take somebody and tell them, be curious now. You know, that's not possible. So what they do is, for example, in this particular experiment uh, conducted by Marike Yepma, a Dutch uh, neuroscientist, is that they showed people this collection of images where they first show them a blurred image and then they show them a clear images. Sometimes of the same object, like the accordion here. They show a blurred image of an accordion. They ask people what do they think that is and so on, try to make them curious about that. And then they show them the real accordion. Now, in order to confuse them so that people don't always expect the same thing, sometimes they show them a blurred image and an, a clear image of something completely different and things like this. Like, you see, they show something there, and then they show this tiger, which are unrelated, and things of that nature. But what they found was that, indeed, for the case of perceptual curiosity, the regions in our brain that are activated are those that are associated with conflict, with hunger, with thirst, things like that. So it's like, like a basic need. It's an unpleasant situation. So for perceptual curiosity, the information gap model actually works quite well. Now, and it and, and, and also uh, uh, shows this inverted U uh, shape uh, curve. Now, what about epistemic curiosity? I remind you, that's the true love of knowledge, the thing that drives us to be scientists, things like that, yes? So there is another experiment done by a researcher named Kang and her collaborators. And what they did in this case is they presented the uh, subjects with a series of trivia questions. I remind you, this is what we're t testing now the, the love of knowledge, the wanting to learn, things of that nature, yes? So they presented them with trivia questions such as, um, I don't know, you know, which musical instrument was invented so as to sound like a human voice. Okay, do you know what that is? The violin, yeah. So, uh, so, you know, so the questions like this, and they also, you know, checked how curious people were about this and so on. And they discovered that in this case, actually, curiosity was associated with a pleasurable state. Yes, and this actually has been suggested by another psychologist uh, named Spielberger, uh, that when we want to learn something, that's associated with a pleasurable state. And indeed, the areas of the brain that were activated by this type of curiosity were those associated with an anticipation of a, or reward, of a reward. Namely, our brains interpret the acquisition of knowledge as a reward. It's a bit like, you know, when we get uh, chocolate or when we get drugs or, you know, or we win the lottery or things like that, an anticipation of reward. When you uh, sit uh, in a theater in a play you always wanted to see and you wait for the curtain to go up, things like that. So, in, in other words, in terms of these two types of curiosity, not only are they associated with different states of mind, namely perceptual curiosity, this surprise, ambiguous stimuli, and so on, is an unpleasant state, an aversive state, and it also triggers regions in the brain that are associated with such states. In the case of epistemic curiosity, this love of knowledge, this is a pleasurable state, an anticipation of reward, and it triggers area in the brain that are associated with such rewards. Now, all these experiments that I described so far are done with adults. Uh, in fact, you may know or you may not know that most experiments in psychology until fairly recently 
were done with either freshmen or sophomore students. So uh, there were some people that jokingly used to say that, in fact, all the results in psychology only apply to that demographic, because all the experiments were done with those type of people. But in, in recent, uh, uh, already a couple of decades, uh, people started doing experiments with very small children even, very, very small children. So I want to describe to you an experiment here that was done at MIT. And the idea is the following. There is a very small child, um, and the child is shown a particular toy. And when the researcher presses a button on the toy, the toy makes a certain noise. And then you will see what happens after that. So she now presses that button, and it makes a noise. So look, the child already wants it, already wants that toy. She presses the button again, again the noise. Now, the researcher shows the child that she has two other things that look similar, of different color. She puts one there, and she gives the green toy to the child. The child immediately tries to press it, and he doesn't make the noise. So look what the child does. Turns to his or her parent, because it's, she thinks, or he thinks, maybe I'm doing something wrong here. Now she's giving the child the yellow toy, which looks a bit different, but still has something that looks a bit like the previous button. So look, she will try, or he will try, to press it, but nothing happened. So now she says, ah, maybe it's broken. So she bangs it, you see. But now she sees the red toy that's there on that piece of cloth. So look what, what she does, or that, what he does. Look, whoop, and gets that. So this very small child was able, first of all, to understand confounded evidence, namely the fact that it didn't work for him or her. You cannot tell here if it's a, if it's a boy or a girl. Could be of two causes. Maybe she's doing something wrong, or maybe the toy is broken, and found a way, you know, to get to the other toy. Now. It turns out that what small children are most interested about are cause and effect. They want to understand cause and effect. You, you know how small children ask why all the time? Why da da da? Why da da da? Why da? Sometimes it drives you nuts. Uh, but they ask because they want to understand. They understand very early on that every effect is linked to some cause. And they want to understand that. Now, what that does is it also makes for a very specific prediction. And the prediction is that when children like this will see a situation which violates their expectation, then they will be most curious because that disagrees with what they expected. They want to decrease to a minimum their predictive errors, which is I'm sure you do in your professional life too. Just try to reduce to a minimum your predictive errors. Now, here is an experiment that tested this idea. And the experiment looks something like this. There is an object, this blue object, which looks, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not symmetrical. And the object can, in principle, be put in equilibrium on this pole. Now, the experiment was done with three groups of children, one age roughly average five, six, and seven. So what the researchers did was the following. First, they asked the kids you know, to try to balance this asymmetrical object on the pole. Now, there were kids, especially the, well, there are the smaller kids who really didn't know what to do. But the middle kids, they tended more than not, to try to balance it at the geometrical middle. You know, like the lower left uh, picture there, where it is balanced exactly in the middle. The somewhat bigger kids, actually who you know had some notion of center of mass, things like that, tried to balance it more closer to the heavier edge, like in the top right image in this case, okay? Now, 
what the researchers did was something very clever. The kids took the thing and wanted to place it there. The researchers looked to see where do they try to place it, in the middle or close to the heavy earth. But before they put it there, they grabbed it from them. So they knew now what was the belief of the children. They knew if the children thought that it is in the middle or thought that it is at the center of mass. Now they showed the kids a particular configuration. Let's say like the lower left, where it's balanced in the middle. That was belief consistent to the kids who thought it should be in the middle and belief violating to the kids who thought it should be at the center of mass. And what they discovered is that whenever it was belief violating, the kids really wanted to explore more. The other kids just wanted to play with a new toy. And this was true also in the other case, you know, where it was at the center of mass. Again, the same type of situation repeated itself. Now, they even added another trick onto this. When they showed some kids that actually the thing was balanced where it was balanced because there was a magnet there holding it in place. Once they showed that there is a magnet there, the kids didn't care anymore if it was belief violating because they say, oh, the magnet does it. And that's it. So kids really are interested in cause and effect very, very much. OK. How did we get to this situation where our brains you know, are able to do all these questions, why, and so on, and this, and other animals, believe it or not, they cannot. I mean, we are the only species that asks why. Other animals can be curious, but they are not interested in why. How do we know that? How do we know that chimpanzees don't know, well, these are gorillas, but how do they, we know that uh, chimpanzees don't ask why? I'll tell you how. There's a very interesting experiment that did the following. Two kids, average age, between three and five, and a whole bunch of chimpanzees. And they took an object which looked completely symmetrical, and it could be made to stand. But the researchers hid inside some weights that made it such that you couldn't really make it stand. It just kept falling. Whatever you did, it kept falling. The kids, these very small kids, once they saw you cannot make it stand, more than 60% of them took the thing, examined it from all sides, examined it with their hands, you know, and so on. None of the chimpanzees did any of that. The chimpanzees just try, kept trying to make it stand. The chimpanzees really did not understand that there is some hidden question here that needs to be answered, why the thing doesn't stand. They even identified, actually, the region in the brain that is different between humans and, let's say, macaque monkeys. They did experiments with macaques. So humans are the only ones who ask why. Now, why is that? Well, partly it may be related to the fact that we have about 86 billion neurons in our heads. and. Uh, the chimpanzees or gorillas, they, they have about a third of that. Now, how did all of that happen? In particular, what counts is the neurons in our cerebral cortex and in the striatum. This is where you know, all our consciousness, if you like, lies. Okay? This is Lucy. This is the skeleton of Lucy. This is the nearly human female that was found in Ethiopia. It dates to 3.2 million years ago. It's a pre-human type thing. Uh, this is what they think Lucy probably looked like. She was about three and a half feet tall, um, walked mostly upright, and ate probably mostly fruit, but was a vegetarian in general, mostly fruit. Um, but then when you start looking at the homo species, you know, homo habilis, the handyman, and then you know, Homo erectus, the, that walks on two feet, and eventually Homo sapiens, which, you know, we are. Uh, and you look at the way their brain increased, it is something amazing. I mean, the brain from the time of Lucy increased by, you know, a factor of 
three or so. Uh, and what caused that? Well, it turns out that's a complicated question because the brain also consumes a lot of energy. The human brain consumes about 25% of the energy consumption of the body, even though in weight our brain is only like 3% or something. Um, in other species, uh, the brain consumes only about 10% of the energy consumption of the body. So why is that? What's going on? Well, the real difference in that is in the number of neurons we have. And this, and like I said, especially in our cerebral cortex. But, okay, so there is a difference between primates, which is, you know, all the apes and us, and other species. And that difference is in how many neurons you can pack into a smaller volume. In, in humans, it scales linearly. Namely, if you want a brain that's two times, to have twice the number of neurons, the brain will weigh twice. So it scales linearly. On the other hand, in, uh, in, in let's say, rodents, the power law is completely different. A brain, if you want a brain that has 10 times more neurons, the brain has to weigh 50 times more. So, so that gives primates their first advantage over other species. We can cram more neurons into a smaller volume. But that still doesn't explain you know, why we ask why and not the chimpanzees, the, you know, the gorillas and, and so on, which are actually even bigger than us. But this is where this business of the energy comes in. Uh, because you see, there is only so much energy that an animal can produce from foraging for food. Because an animal cannot search for food for more than eight or nine hours a day, or it would just die. So you look at the maximum that it can forage, and then you know you look at, okay, how much, how much weight you can support and what kind of a brain you can support. And when you look at that, in simple terms, it turns out that for 165 pounds, let's say, you can support at most maybe 30 billion neurons, which is about a third of what we have. So what gave us this advantage over these other primates? Well, it, nobody knows precisely the answer to that, but it's probably a combination of a few factors. One is, believe it or not, cooking. So you're here at Google, you get very good food. Uh, which is being cooked, and that's very good because cooking allows you to get more energy for, you know, from the same type of thing because you can digest it more easily. Uh, you can digest types of food that otherwise our body could not digest, you know, like rice, let's say, or things like that. Um, and th so th there are a few other things. The digestive system as a result of cooking and other things became shorter in humans, and the digestive system consumes a lot of energy by itself. Walking upright is another thing, because walking on four and knuckles consumes more energy than walking on two. And what I like to say is that curiosity also played a role in this mix, in a way of a, some sort of a feedback. Because, you see, imagine, you know, these early humans once saw uh, a fire hit a forest, and then uh, some animal got burned. Then out of curiosity, okay, they tried to eat that. And they found that, aha, this is easier to chew, and uh, you know, and it tastes maybe better, and things like that. Or, uh, you know, Homo habilis, you know, started to f do some tools. Uh, he or she discovered that, oh, I, if I uh, somehow sharpen this, this branch here, then I can get into the bones and get the bone marrow out of that, and that's very tasty, and things like that. So uh, a combination of these factors gave us our advantage. Now, from everything I've told you so far, you realize that curiosity actually is one of the most important things in our lives, because it drives almost everything we do. From a simple conversation, you would not have a conversation with somebody if he or she bores you stiff. 
I mean, you have to be somewhat curious about what they have to say. You would not read a book or a blog or anything if you're not curious about what this person has to say. You will not see a film if you're not somewhat curious about it. And you will not get involved in a research if you are not curious about it, unless, of course, your boss forces you to get engaged in that research. But generally, I mean, somebody had to be curious about that in order to start that research project, right? So curiosity drives all of these things. Now, given that that's the situation, you might have thought that at all times and at all ages, people would always encourage and support curiosity. Well, that's not the case. For example, in the Middle Ages, you know, there were entire periods where, you know, church orthodoxy or other things, you know, actually tried to build walls around various types of knowledge and say, oh, we already know everything that is worth knowing and you, you shouldn't be curious about other things that's not good for you. This manifested itself even in fairy tales. Here is just a drawing of Hansel and Gretel, you know, who go exploring in the forest, find this house made of candy, and, uh, you know, fall into the hands of a cannibalistic witch. That's not exactly encouraging curiosity. And there are more complicated things than this. In 1937, the Nazi regime organized in Munich the Degenerate Art Exhibit, where they collected all the works of all the masters of modern art, you know, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, Paul Klee, all these people, and put them together in an exhibit which was supposed to convince the masses that this is all some malicious plot of Jews and communists against Germany. Uh, this is Goebbels visiting the, the, this art exhibit. So you see all of these things, and uh, we must be very careful about our curiosity. And I coined the phrase, which I'm very proud of, which is, curiosity is the best remedy for fear. Because, you see, we are very often afraid of things that we don't know or don't understand or look strange to us. And if you become curious about them, then you are not any more fearful of them. And I was very satisfied when I discovered that, you know, I thought I invented this phrase, and I did. But I wasn't the only one who thought about something like this. In 2008, there was an art exhibit in Copenhagen, and they put this sign up, replace fear of the unknown with curiosity, which is very much the same. Now, as part of this book, I also, I told you, I interviewed nine exceptionally curious people who live today. So I'll tell you very quickly who they are. So Freeman Dyson was a legendary physicist, Noam Chomsky, Story Musgrave, Fabiola Gianotti, Marilyn Vos Savant, Jack Horner, Martin Rees, Brian May, and Vic Muniz. Let me tell you very briefly who they are. Vic Muniz is a Brazilian artist uh, who makes, he recreates works of art from everything, from chocolate syrup. He can recreate the Mona Lisa. From mustard and diamonds, he recreates, you know, maybe the Night Watch. He used garbage and garbage collectors to recreate master full works of art. Uh, Brian May was the lead guitarist of Queen, the rock band, but he's also a PhD in astrophysics. He was the chancellor of John Moore's University in Liverpool. He's a big, big advocate for animal rights. He's an expert in Victorian stereophotography, so has many interests. Lord Martin Rees, a very famous cosmologist, but also founded the Center for Existential Risks, about all the risks that humanity is facing, and things of that nature. Jack Horner is from Montana. He uh, is a big paleontologist. He was a um, science advisor to all the Jurassic Park movies. Uh, he's also extremely dyslectic. He told me that he can read today like a second grader. 
And, you know, when I asked him, how is that possible? How can you do research if you cannot read? And you know what he told me? He said, I tell my students, if you do it first, you don't have to read that much. So, <laughs> you know, so, and it's true at some level. Marlene Vos Savant uh, is actually an autodidact. She never finished even an undergraduate degree, but she has the highest recorded IQ in history, uh, 228. I remind you that above 140, you're considered a genius. So now, of course, the scale actually is completely unreliable by the time you get to those places. But the fact that she's very high up there is enough. This is Fabiola Gianotti. She's the director general of CERN in Geneva, you know, the Large Hadron Collider. She led one of the teams that discovered the Higgs boson. But her first degree was in music. She's an accomplished pianist, plays to this very day. Story Musgrave, a very famous astronaut. He serviced the Hubble Space Telescope. But he also has degrees in literature, in engineering, in computer science. He is a medical doctor. He's a pilot. He has seven children. <laughs> I mean, you know, he, 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 just, he just did everything. Noam Chomsky needs no introduction. He's a very famous linguist, but also interested in the brain, in music, in, in many things. He's a political activist and so on. And Freeman Dyson is a legendary physicist, you know, uh, formulated, uh, you know, different uh, versions of QED, of quantum electrodynamics. But he, he did, there is almost no branch in physics, mathematics, and so on he didn't work on, even biology. So these were the people I, I interviewed. And the thing that I found most amazing about each one of them is the following. And, and that's maybe the biggest lesson. That at every stage in their life, it doesn't matter what their principal occupation was. They were open to new problems and questions. And they saw around them all the time new opportunities and new things that need to be solved. You know, Freeman Dyson, at, at his ninth, after his 90th birthday, gave an interview where he tries to find an algorithm that will make clinical trials safer. You know, at his 90th birthday. So, at all ages, you can still be curious. Now, I cannot finish a talk about curiosity without returning to Leonardo, who said once, blinding ignorance does mislead us. Oh, wretched mortals, open your eyes. And the one person that is my icon, I'm an astrophysicist, and who opened his eyes all the time, Einstein here opened his, his eyes once and uh, twice <laughs> and uh, thrice. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a little bit of time for questions, and here's a question. Um, what would you say is the relation between creativity and curiosity? Yes, the, the relation between creativity and curiosity. Okay, so there is this. Um, very well-known psychologist from University of Chicago. He's now retired, but very well-known. His name is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And he actually did a big study on creativity. In particular, he interviewed about 100 creative people. And he discovered that curiosity was absolutely essential to each one of them. So creativity and curiosity are not the same. But curiosity appears to be a necessary ingredient for creativity. Any other questions? Other questions? So uh, sometimes I think about the downside of curiosity. The what? The downside of like curiosity, yes. Yes. which is the fear of missing out, uh, like thing like that. I feel like I don't have enough time to try everything, and I often feel sad about that. When you interview people, or maybe yourself, when you think about that, like, what do you think? How people deal with that? Yes. So 
indeed, look, you cannot be curious about everything. Uh, there just isn't enough time for that, even if you wanted to be curious. So you do have to be a little bit selective in, in the things that you get curious about, yes? But the thing is the following. The problem is very often the opposite of what you describe. Namely, people who get so immersed in what they do that, you know, it's not even clear that they are driven anymore by curiosity. Maybe they are just driven by the wanting to succeed, which is not exactly the same, yes? So they want to succeed or they want to make more money. So they are not really driven by curiosity. They are driven by wanting to make more money. I'm not saying there is something against that, but this is more often the problem than the problem you describe. You describe somebody who is curious, wants to be curious about many things, but maybe doesn't quite have the time to get curious about everything that... Uh, so, you, you know, prioritize your, your things, namely, choose a few things that you are really curious about and get interested about them. And, you know, in different stages in life, you actually may do... You see, I didn't start writing books. I, I worked in astrophysics most of my life, and only in 2000 I started writing popular science books. This is my sixth book. So until that, I wasn't that interested in writing books. I wanted to write papers. I, I wrote more than 400 papers, you know. So, but then at one point in my life, I said, you know what? Uh, suppose I will write 10 more papers, 20 more papers, 50 more papers. Is that really going to make a huge difference? And you know, very often you decide that probably not, because being a theoretical physicist, we tend to do our best work when we're relatively young. You know? So at that point I said, well, let me try to reach a broader audience, you know, and so on, and started to be interested in science writing. So you may still find a time in your life when you will be curious about something else. I, I all the time, for example, I'm very interested in art, was always interested in art. So I, you know, do science and I always liked art. I have no talents in art, but I'm very interested in art. So I have many art books and things like that. Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> there have been arguments about how violence, for instance, Steven Pinker wrote a book saying that violence has decreased over you know, since the beginning of dawn of humanity till now, he, he did like you know, 500 pages of research. Uh, similarly, we know the life expectancy has increased, uh, increased over time. Do you, can, you, can we say something like that about curiosity? Do you think it has changed or increased or decreased? So, yes. So this is a very important question, I think. So there are many people who think, for example, that curiosity decreases with age because they say, look, children are so curious and so on, and then they are less curious. Well, research shows that that's not quite the case. What happens is that diversive curiosity, and perhaps perceptual, does decrease somewhat with age. Namely, search for novelty uh, and willing to take risks for novelty does de decrease somewhat with age. But epistemic curiosity, for example, this love of knowledge and so on, actually stays fairly constant across uh, the time. Uh, now, has it changed? in terms of you know evolution of humans well cl clearly you know i i have to think even though nobody knows for, with certainty that this huge advantage that we got in terms of the number of neurons in our cerebral cortex and striatum had to do something with the fact that we are so much more curious than than these other species so presumably during evolution a change of that kind did happen uh, now, at the same time, I, I noted these periods in our history where, you know, sometimes curiosity is suppressed or, you know, and so on. So we have to be very careful about those. Yes. Um, does being curious have a compounding effect? That is to say, if you are curious, curious do you become do you more stay, curious? Right. Well, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure what you do at Google, but scientists usually are in a state where almost answering almost every question just raises more questions and sometimes more profound questions. 
For example, in fundamental physics, that's the case. We keep pushing you know, the questions farther and farther. Uh, today, we answer questions that 100 years ago, we didn't even know how to ask. Uh, so there is no question that there is an element like this that you could actually become even more curious. But certainly, the opposite is true. I think if you allow yourself not to be curious for a long period of time, you're probably, you know, you decline into a state of lower curiosity. Now, mind you, every person is curious. Other than people who suffer from deep depression or have certain brain injuries, everybody is curious. Not everybody is curious the same, in the same way that not everybody is intelligent the same or has some talents the same. And also, not everybody um, is in, uh, curious about the same things, but they may be curious about other things. And we have one more question. Please. Hi, um, this is, was a wonderful talk, and my last question, I guess, is about what you believe is cure. Um, how do I ask this? So. One way to think about curiosity, I guess, is that uh, curiosity can be like a resulting phenomenon from a situation in which you do have sufficient knowledge, but not enough knowledge to really understand right. something. Right, that's the information um, gap. Yeah. And then <clears throat> on the other side of things, you could also think of um, like human capability to take um, to feel curious and or human capability to um, take effect and or act upon that kind of curiosity. I'm wondering like what your views are on whether you can um, improve like a human's capability to feel more curious or things like that. Yeah, so uh, I, I think this should start from small children. Um, and the way I think that works is, you see sometimes, uh, this is a new book, so I only had uh, so far a few talks on this. But people ask me, you know, how do I make my child more curious? You know, people ask, ask me questions like this. Uh, or somebody asks me, how do I make my, my co-workers more curious? And the way to achieve that, again, I'm not a specialist in education, but that's my perception from everything I've now read, you know, and, 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 and learned, is that you have to start with things that they are already curious about. And the e example I like to give is that most small children are curious about dinosaurs, for example. Most American small children are curious about dinosaurs. So if you want to teach them science, don't start with trying to explain to them the free fall acceleration, which they really don't care about at all. Start with dinosaurs, because they are already interested in that. And then from dinosaurs, you know, you can perhaps, you know, lead them. If you think about this thoughtfully enough, you can find a way, you know, you can start with the dinosaurs. And then the dinosaurs uh, were, we think, were extinct, became extinct because of an asteroid that hit the Earth. And once an asteroid hit the Earth, you start to... Uh, I'm just saying, maybe you wanted to tell them about free fall acceleration. Then you say, okay, an asteroid hit the Earth. Oh, we can actually try to calculate how much energy is an asteroid that hit the Earth, and, and so on. So start with what interests them already, instead of starting with what you think they should be interested in, because they may not be interested in that. Thank you so much for coming to Google. And we know that you're now working on the next book, which you say might take four or five years. And I'm wondering, uh, we'll remind you all, this one is Y. And we can pick up copies here today. And I'm wondering if the next one might be Z for Z answer. And we'll have to stay <laughs> tuned to find out. Thank you again, Mario Livio. My pleasure.